So good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, this evening's meeting. We're very pleased to uh, have with us uh, Julie Attard uh, from the National Forest Company, who's going to be talking about uh, the first year of the Chanwood, Ch sorry, Chanwood Forest Landscape Partnership Scheme. You're probably better at saying that than I am. You've probably had more <laughs> practice. practice. Absolutely. Um, so uh, Julie, uh, uh, over to you. We're, we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, well, good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, as Alan said, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, the first year of the Charmwood Forest Landscape Partnership Scheme. Um, and I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes or so, and then there'll be an opportunity for questions as well at, at, at the end. Um, but I thought I'd start with just um, a very brief overview for those of you that may not be familiar with the Landscape Partnership Scheme, and then we'll sort of dive into the highs and lows of the Year One projects and, and what's been achieved so far. So the first thing I wanted to talk about really is, is why Charmwood Forest matters, um, why this, uh, what we've called the unexpected upland, because it is quite different to the rest of Leicestershire. It has an upland character, a mosaic of woodland, heathland, acid grassland, neutral grassland, um, as you know, uh, four reservoirs, ponds, and streams. Um, and it is really a, a very special landscape. And we had a, a visit last Friday from the CEO of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, and he was absolutely blown away by it. And, and visitors often frequently remark that it is just such an unexpected uh, area to find in the middle of Leicestershire. And of course, that character is, is derived from its very special underlying geology, which has affected uh, the topography, soils, uh, the land use, the biodiversity, of course, and then the economy of, of the area. Nowhere else in the county holds such a concentration of key wildlife sites and habitats. Uh, so the Charmwood Forest covers about 158 square kilometres, so it's about 8% of the county by area, uh, but it accounts for 51% um, of all of Leicestershire's sites of special scientific interest, 43% of its ancient woodlands, 32% of its local wildlife sites, um, so it's incredibly important uh, for, for natural history and for biodiversity. It also has internationally significant geological heritage. So we have fossils in Charnwood Forest that capture uh, that, that very special moment where we transition from microbial life to complex life forms. Uh, so we're talking about, you know, sort of 580 million years ago and that, that moment where life becomes complex and we have uh, the first animals um, on, on Earth that we are aware of. Um, and many of you will, will know the story of the discovery of uh, Charney and Mason I by, um, well, Tina Negus and Roger Mason, who discovered uh, those fossils and they are internationally significant. And then, of course, uh, it's got important cultural and built heritage, of course, um, which incorporates that, that, that geology in many places. 23 ancient monuments, uh, four graded one and 20 grade two star and 333 grade two listed buildings, 14 conservation areas. So it's a really significant um, area of heritage. Um, but sadly, despite its importance, it's an area that is under pressure in various ways. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what some of those threats are, because it's important for the understanding of the approach that has to be taken to conserving Charnwood Forest. So many landscapes of high heritage value and distinctiveness generally have some kind of formal designation or status like a na national park or an AONB. And unfortunately, Charnwood Forest doesn't have any of those kinds of designations. And that poses some challenges for us um, at managing that area at landscape scale. Much of the area is in private ownership. We've got four local authorities covering the area. So Leicestershire County Council, Charnwood Borough Council, um, Hinckley and Bosworth and uh, North West Leicestershire. And coordinating the activities of those can be quite, quite challenging. 
Um, it's obviously encircled by urban development, so you have pressures on the, the edges of the forest as well as in, in its interior. We have the M1 bisecting the area, which also um, adds to this, uh, this potential for this uh, vulnerability to habitat fragmentation and the potential for erosion of character of the area. Um, that population density, not just around the outside of Charmwood Forest, but we've got one and a half million people living within an hour of the area. And it's heavily used for recreation by the surrounding people living in surrounding towns and villages. Um, and of course, there's always issues over transport and access. Um, and I think one of the key things is that lack of understanding of the significance of Charmwood Forest. Um, and so sometimes it's it's a matter of trying to counter the, the the damage that can be accidental that's done to childhood forest simply because people are unaware that their actions are putting sites at risk so you know how do we encourage people to leave their cars at home um, and to to uh, how do we encourage them to give up a little bit of their time to help us care for the landscape that they regularly enjoy um, we've also got some challenges around capacity and that's in some cases around staffing capacity and the fact that that has been gently chipped away at over the many years of austerity uh, with fewer staff at some at local authorities and in other uh, organisations. Um, where there are issues with levels of volunteering in various organisations that help care for Charmwood Forest. Uh, the intensity, real or perceived, of, of modern life um, means that sometimes people are less willing to perhaps volunteer uh, than they were previously in previous generations. So how do we design new opportunities for people to become involved in caring and conserving Charmwood Forest um, so that our current volunteer bodies do not dwindle to unsustainable levels? And of course, it's also a landscape where people live and work and it's used in many different ways. And that means if we're going to conserve the area, uh, we need to work with local communities, with local businesses and landowners to plot a way forward uh, today, but also thinking ahead into the future um, and thinking about how we make the area resilient um, to the impact of climate change, etc. So the risks facing Charmwood Forest are indeed severe and they could have far reaching effects, but there are actions that we can take to mitigate those uh, risks and to take advantage of the many opportunities that a more joined up approach to working together to manage the area um, can provide. And really this is where the, the landscape partnership scheme comes in. And these are some of the complex challenges and pressures that we're attempting to address through the landscape partnerships. Um, those of you who've been kind of following this will know that the, the journey to get to the point where we've got the funding for this scheme has been a very long one indeed. Um, so Leicestershire County Council put in an unsuccessful bid in 2013 for a, a large project focused on Charmwood Forest. Um, this was followed by a successor bid, which was awarded a first round pass in December 2017. And then there followed after that an 18 month development phase from April 2018 to October 2019 um, to allow us to sort of develop the, 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 the landscape partnership scheme. And then we had a long wait for the National Lottery Heritage Fund to review the position. And we finally found out that we'd been successful in March 2020 literally just as the pandemic hit. So it uh, wasn't a great time for us to, uh, to be able to start um, the, the, the project um, and obviously it has had a massive impact on us over the first year. And I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. Um, but first, um, I thought I would just say a little bit about what a landscape partnership scheme is. Um, it's a program of integrated projects that are carried out by a partnership of organisations at landscape scale. So in a way, it's a kind of Ron Seal thing. It does exactly what it says on the tin. It's about a whole landscape and all of the activities are done at landscape scale. It's uh, carried out in partnership. So it's not one organisation per project. It's actually a group of organisations working together to do the whole scheme. 
um, and it's more than just a single focus project. Its purpose is to bring about better coordination of management at landscape scale, a better collective understanding of the needs of the landscape and how best to meet those needs, um, an opportunity to, to build capacity and to work together in much closer cooperation and collaboratively sharing resources uh, so that we can achieve maximum benefits for the landscape. So it's not just about what we do, it's not just about the projects itself, but it's about how we do it as well. It's about how we work together, setting in effect a, a way of working that will carry us through into the future long after the lottery funding has, has ended. Now, a five-year scheme is never going to solve all of Charmwood Forest's uh, problems. Um, so it's a collection of strategic projects which are designed to bring about that long-term support and greater as it faces the challenges and threats I've described. It. So the, the value of the scheme is £3.73 million. The lion's share of that is coming from the National Lottery Heritage Fund grant, which is 2.78 million, and that was as I as I mentioned awarded in March 2020. The project's running for five years until June 2025, and it's hosted by the National Forest Company, but is a partnership of 18 organisations. Um, so these are not the only organisations that are going to be involved in the project, but these are the ones in effect that are taking collective responsibility for the scheme. And you can see on there that it's a range of local authorities, larger national agencies like the Environment Agency, British Geological Survey, um, local, cha local charitable trusts like um, Sustainable Land Trust, Charmwood Arts. Um, so there's a, a great deal of uh, different organisations at different scales, operating at different scales that are involved in the scheme and they're working together to deliver the whole thing. And they're supported by a small delivery team led by me. Um, so there are two full-timers and three part-timers, and our posts are funded directly by the lottery grant. We're employed by the National Forest Company, but we're working on behalf of the whole partnership. So our obligations are to every all of those organisations on there, not just the National Forest Company. Within the team, uh, we have Helen Smith, who's our finance and admin officer. Um, she has a background in, in working in business administration and charity management, so working with mental health charities. We have Dr. Jack Matthews, who's our Geo Heritage Officer. Jack has a PhD uh, in the Ediacaran Fossil, for which Charmer Forest is famous. Um, and he's done a lot of work out in Newfoundland, in Canada, uh, working on conservation over there of the Charmwood uh, fossils, ones that are very similar to Charmwood fossils. We have Dr. Susan Kilby, who some of you may know from the Charmwood Roots Project of Leicestershire Victoria County East Trust. Uh, so Susan is our heritage education officer. She's a medieval historian and she's worked on a number of fascinating research projects, um, most recently preparing educational resources for schools in the Shropshire AOMV and at Nottingham City Council. And Carolyn Holmes, who some of you will know, is formerly the development manager at Bradgate Park, who's worked on numerous outreach engagement and conservation projects in the county and beyond. Uh, so that's the delivery team and we're supporting uh, a number of other organisations and officers that are based at the organisations that are on the screen now. We have a steering group which oversees the scheme and then a regional park board uh, which sits at a higher level and that provides strategic direction for the whole of Charmwood Forest, not just during the life of the landscape partnership scheme but exists before it and will exist after it and we pass on to them anything outside of the scope. So the scheme uh, delivery area is shown with this green boundary here. So this is the boundary of Charmwood Forest Regional Park. And all of our capital works and conservation activities are taking place within that boundary. Um, but for the purposes of our kind of outreach activities, that boundary is permeable. Um, and we're, we're focusing a substantial amount of our outreach activity on the three urban communities of Loughborough, Leicester and Colville. Um, many of whom, as we know, travel into the forest for recreation. So it's quite important that we're uh, talking to them, that we're helping them understand the value of Charmwood Forest so that when they come and visit for recreation, that they are, um, are actually helping support the management, caring for Charmwood and not doing things which might undermine that. 
So just a small point about the, the kind of um, the evidence base for the work that's gone into planning the, the projects that are part of the scheme. Um, during the 18 month development phase, before we secured the funding, we had to carry out uh, a great deal of research to make sure that the projects that we were putting forward were actually going to help the area and were going to work at that strategic landscape scale. Um, so we carried out a number of studies that I've listed, listed here uh, to help us and identify where we could make the biggest differences for the future. Um, and that included things like our Geo Heritage Conservation Interpretation Report, which we did with the Jurassic Coast Trust and the British Geological Survey and a number of researchers at Oxford and Cambridge University. Biodiversity Audit, which was um, had great input from Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust and from a number of recorders, county recorders that were involved, um, volunteers that were involved in uh, wildlife projects, um, nature spots, all sorts of different organisations that helped us pull together the data um, to, to help us understand where we could make the biggest difference for biodiversity in Charmel Forest. Um, a landscape character assessment, which was carried out by FPCR, a landscape architect firm, who did a fantastic uh, study for us, um, which was actually nominated for a Landscape Institute Award. Um, so that's going to be a, that's a really useful document that many parishes are now using in their neighbourhood plans um, and their local plans. So again, a really great resource. Um, and then a number of other studies, which I won't go into in full detail now, as they're probably slight, of slightly less interest uh, to, to this group. And then we also carried out, of course, lots of consultation and involved the Charmwood Forest Stakeholder Forum in that, which is a group of about 80 different organisations uh, with an interest in Charmwood Forest. So uh, onto the, the, the projects themselves and what we're actually doing in Charmwood Forest. And um, these are divided into three themes. They're based around a quote from Sir David Attenborough, who said that no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they've never experienced. So if we want people to care for and conserve Charmwood Forest, they need to have direct experience of it and understand why it's precious and what they can do to help. So we want people to, to explore and experience Charmwood Forest, to understand its importance, value it, and then encourage people to get involved in helping us actively to care for it. So our 18 projects are divided into so we've got Explore Charmwood, um, which is uh, four, which are four projects designed to help people to spend time outdoors and experience the landscape. We have Understand Charmwood, where there are five projects designed to help people to uncover more about the area's heritage and to connect people with the landscape. And that includes all of our education projects. And then we have Care for Charmwood, which it consists of nine projects designed to actively involve people and organisations protecting and managing the landscape. So onto the, what we've actually done in the last year and, and how things are, have been going within the scheme. Um, well, obviously, when we got the, the news that we'd been awarded the funding, we were then plunged straight into the, uh, the first few months of the pandemic when we were in lockdown, we were unable to get, um, to get work up and running. Um, we couldn't, uh, many of the organizations that we were working with were furloughing staff. So it was a, a very, very challenging period to be launching a four million pound project. And um, I have to say that for the first six months Though, um, of the landscape partnership scheme, we were really felt like we were trying to do it with you know one hand tied behind our back, and and it has been incredibly challenging to get some of the projects, particularly those that involve uh, bringing people together, which of course is partly what this um this project is all about. But that, that we we have managed to do all sorts of great work, and I'm going to share some of that with you. But um, I, I just wanted to really point out that. It hasn't all been, despite the great things I'm going to show you, it hasn't all been um, in, in plain sailing. And of course, um, the pandemic, on the one hand, highlighted the importance of, of nature to our health and well-being, but on the, on the other hand, put many of our sites under enormous pressure. 
Um, those of you that got out during the pandemic to places like um, Bradgate Park and Beacon Hill and the Outwood will have seen this. Um, you know, many times that those, those sites had to close, they had to close their car parks, they, they were under enormous visitor pressure. Um, and we certainly didn't want to add to that by encouraging more people to, to go out and visit those, um, those sites. Of course, our public transport projects had to be put on hold because people were being discouraged from using public transport. Um, we couldn't carry out our outreach road shows, which would have seen us running a programme of events, moving place to place and interacting with local communities and some of the health projects that we were intending to, to, to carry out with particularly vulnerable groups. We found that obviously many of them were shielding during the pandemic and that meant we weren't able to, to work directly with them. Um, within the Explore Charmwood theme we also had a, a programme that's focused on the visitor economy and visitor economy businesses were, of course, under enormous pressure with repeated lockdowns and changes to regulation. And they were really unable to see beyond surviving the next few weeks. It was really unthinkable to try and get them to think seriously about future developments and about new projects and taking on new initiatives. Um, so really that there were some things that we couldn't do and some things which were just simply not appropriate to try and launch during that, that period. However, we did do lots of really great work during, during the, the first year in this theme. Um, and one of the things that we started was a, with the Ramblers Association was a programme of doorstep walks. So this was a really a response to wanting to help people to explore their immediate surroundings and to provide suggestions for people who perhaps would normally hop in their car and head out to one of the more obvious sites like Bradgate or Beacon Hill. Um, so we created 20 walks in all, one for every settlement in the forest, and these were shared in their raw form at the time, but they're now being developed into a series of downloadable leaflets with mapping, which will potentially also be put on as guided walks. Um, and really, they're designed to help those that are less confident about using the rights of way network to get out and explore their local area without having to use their car. Um, from the, the first summer onwards, it became possible to contemplate some public engagement activity, though still not without some risks and difficulties. And we decided to play on the unexpected upland tagline with a series of pop-up events where we would basically randomly appear with no advertising and put on an activity um, or event. This allowed us to do it, um, control numbers, um, it, it was low risk, so if anybody came down with COVID, we didn't have to cancel and try and let everybody know that the events were no longer going to happen and this worked really well and people actually enjoyed being surprised with a, a sort of pop-up talk or a game or activity uh, when they were out and about in Charmwood and we've now got a regular program of events which are up and running and most of those are now pre-programmed and can be advertised in a way that obviously wasn't possible during the pandemic. Um, so do look out for us in Charmwood Forest over the summer. There's going to be lots of online talks, some international research conferences, local events. Um, and I'll, I'll say a bit more later about how you can keep in touch with our uh, public outreach programmes. So uh, I mentioned that some of the groups that we were planning to work with um, were shielding. So initially, a lot of the work that we did was um, providing a kind of friendly ear and to uh, bring groups together to talk to one another about some of the challenges that they were facing. And this really reinforced the value of this dimension uh, to the scheme to us. Um, so we were focused on helping just a small number of local charity groups who were supporting communities um, with uh, physical and mental health uh, difficulties. Um, and we realised how important it was that we try and find ways to increase access to nature for those groups. Um, so we've now got a green and social prescriptions programme and a, a, the, a sort of strand of activity called Feel Good in the Forest, which is working with a range of underrepresented groups, including a group of young carers who are um, under the age of 18 and our primary carers for a family member. Um, we're working with adults with learning difficulties who are actually helping us to develop um, resources to help them um, to access nature in a way that is, is difficult for them. Um, and we're also working with groups who suffer from loneliness and isolation. 
uh, providing them with activities that they can do, uh, creative activities, but also out in the forest. Uh, and they're also helping to create installations which will become semi-permanent installations at places like Outwoods, Beacon Hill, Bradgate, and a number of sites. Um, with our visitor economy work, uh, we had some webinars supporting attractions, accommodation providers, and food and drink producers. Um, so we focused, because we couldn't work very closely with any of them, um, given that the challenges I talked about earlier, uh, we focused our work on things that would be useful to the whole sector. Um, so we did a, we carried out an audit of all our visitor economy businesses. So now we know exactly what exists in the forest, how these businesses are clustered, and that will make it easier for us to work with them in the future. Um, and all of that activity, I should say, is linked back to the landscape. We're working with businesses to help them understand um, how they can make use of the, the, the unique nature of Charmwood Forest, both in their, in their marketing, in the kinds of menus that they produce, putting producers in touch with one another so that they know where they can uh, get local produce that they can use within their, um, their, their menus, helping visitor economy businesses to really hone in on what makes Charmwood unique so that they can share that with their visitors rather than really producing something that's very generic that could be the new forest or could be the forest of bee. This is Charmwood Forest. We want visitors to go away with an understanding of what's special about our area. Um, and to that end, we, we did a bit of work with Leicester City Council who were separately organising their Uncover the Story campaign. So we made sure that we input in that so that the stories that were being told about Charmwood Forest were accurate um, and not just um, repeated some of the repeated mistakes that had kind of passed down um, through repeated uh, marketing pamphlets and, and that kind of thing. So that was some quite important work that we've been able to do. So onto the um, understand theme, like the previous theme, uh, those projects that suffered initially were the ones that were focused on bring, physically bringing people together and of course school because um, it was very difficult during the pandemic to, to try and, uh, and work directly with schools. However, since May 2021, um, this area has really made massive progress and um, we've got some fantastic work now going on across the board here. Um, so a learning landscape is uh, the umbrella project for all of our activities with schools. There are two core elements to this. One, which is the creation of outdoor learning spaces and CPD training for teachers to help them use these spaces for all aspects of their teaching of the national curriculum. So this is not about creating outdoor spaces where just particular groups of children get sent when perhaps they're not able to focus on their maths in the classroom or whatever. This is more about how do we use outdoor space uh, to teach all subjects across the board so that children spend more time out in nature, that they have more experiences of um, working outdoors, uh, perhaps less fearful of, um, of, of outdoor activity. Um, and all of the forest school spaces that are creating these outdoor learning spaces um, are also focused on creating more space for nature and actually looking at the specific species habitats which are within Charmwood Forest, making sure that we're, we're kind of linking those to the landscape. Um, so if I can just draw your attention to the picture on the left there, there's a, a, or two pictures on the left, there's a the, the picture um, with the, that's got the building and the rather scrubby looking kind of area, that is at Latimer Primary School in Anstey. And that whole area is going to be transformed into a wonderful um, memorial garden that actually references the Rothley Brook, the landscape. Like, there'll be hedgerows planted alongside the school. Um, there'll be cr the creation of wildlife spaces, um, a fantastic art installation there. And that will really all link into Charmwood Forest landscape, help children to experience that um, on, on their site. Uh, and this is a kind of collaborative project with our a collaborative project with the Landscape Partnership Scheme and the school 
um, who really wanted to do this after their, one of their teachers sadly passed away during the, um, during the pandemic. He was quite a young man, um, very keen on children spending time outdoors, and they raised quite a lot of money to carry out this project on their school site and we've been helping put them in, the, in touch with the right people, um, landscape architects, and, and helping them to design that space. And um, the second strand to the Learning Landscape Project is landscape-led educational resources. So these focus on things like geology, history, um, biodiversity, to help really share all of those things with um, children in the Charmer Forest area. And all of those workshops, assemblies and educational resources are being offered to every single primary school across Charmwood Forest. Um, and we'll also be working on resources to secondary school children in the coming years. Um, we've got a number of other uh, a number of other partnerships with other organisations like Leicester City Football Club um, and uh, the Museum Service and Heartwoods all helping to produce education resources um, and share those more widely. So uh, on the left is my super enthusiastic colleague, Jack, who I sincerely believe could get anyone excited about Charmwood's rocks. Um, he's been carrying out an audit of all of Charmwood's geological sites and thinking about how they can help us tell the story of Charmwood's geology, its fossils, and importantly, the links between geodiversity and biodiversity. So how has the geology of Charmwood created the landscapes and habitats that we have? What's the importance of those connections. He's creating new interpretation for the sites, interpretation plan for the whole area, which will link all of the sites across um, and, and link them so that when visitors come to the area, that they could get the, the story of Charmwood Forest as they move around and um, visiting different sites. Um, and it will help those that are managing the sites to make those connections themselves, um, so producing in effect an interpretation framework that every site will have access to and they will be able to develop their own interpretation, tell the story of their site but also link it to that wider story. Um, and the first sets of interpretation have gone in at the new cafe at Outwards, if any of you have been up you'll have seen some of our um, interpretation on the discovery of the Charnia fossil um, at that site and uh, We've also got some new interpretation, which will be going up at Morley Quarry fairly soon. Community arts um, might not seem like it has a, a great deal to do with um, conserving the landscape, but it's actually a really important strand of the work that we're doing. We're working with uh, Charmwood Arts primarily, um, but they're also helping us to make connections with a whole range of different emerging artists um, and local groups developing, uh, developing that uh, collaborative work. And there are now hundreds and hundreds of people who are benefiting from this programme. And really what we're doing is using art as dialogue, um, art as a means of engagement with people, um, because we're finding that that is a way of reaching groups of people who are perhaps not naturally drawn to learning about Charmwood rocks or Charmwood landscapes, um, but actually through the medium of art, um, we can reach groups of people who might not otherwise engage. Um, and if I can draw your attention to the third picture along, um, Emily Hett there is one of our emerging artists, and she's, in, she's created there a, a tree made out of wood, and the designs that she's painting on there are inspired by a cross-section, um, a scene under the microscope of Charmwood rock. So looking at the minerals within, found within Charmwood's rocks um, under a microscope, looking at the patterns that are created with that, and then creating these very joyful artworks, which can then travel around to some of our city um, and villages and provide a sort of talking point getting people interested in, in learning about uh, Charmwood's rocks. As um, many of you will be aware, 50% um, or so of Charmwood is, is farmland. Uh, the scheme isn't happening in, in isolation, but in the context of wider work around 
um, climate change mitigation, nature recovery strategy, changes to the way that farming subsidies operate. And we have to be kind of mindful of that with all of the work that we're, that we're doing, making sure that we're linking into all of those things. At a community level, many parishes are looking at what they can do locally to um, enhance their areas for biodiversity, to mitigate climate change. Um, and sustainable food production is one of the things that many parishes are interested in. Um, so one of the things that we've put in place is a, a programme to create new orchards um, across Charnwood Forest. So this will be a locally accessible food source, but also um, add to an important habitat in Charnwood Forest. Uh, as some of you will probably know, nationally more than 90% of traditional orchard habitats have been lost since the 1950s. 45% uh, of the remaining English traditional orchards are in declining condition with consequent decline in biodiversity. So we've had a look at historical documents, uh, we've carried out an audit of the existing orchard sites, and now we're helping those that need restoration and management to get that, get the training that they need and to support the grants. Um, and we're also planting new orchards in communities that are keen to have one. So we've got um, coming up over the next year, we're planting eight new orchards across Charnwood Forest. And we've got three sites we're restoring or extending. And alongside that, we've got a package of training and management support to help people that are looking after those orchards um, to, to manage them now and for the future as they, as they develop. And then alongside that, of course, have events and celebrations um, which allow us to get people interested in orchards and helping to care for them um, and helping to, us to, to monitor them and monitor the wildlife uh, that, that come as a result of existing. And that's involving a whole range of organisations from the parish councils, tree wardens, community groups, Leicestershire Heritage Apple Project, the Tree Council. So again another really great example of how that partnership working can bring about benefits for the forest and its communities. Then into the uh, care for theme. Again, one of the, I think, main, the main challenges that we had during the early part of the pandemic um, in this theme was the capacity of staff at key organisations. As I mentioned, we had some organisations that had to furlough people, um, others that were managing sites that were facing incredible visitor pressure and they were too busy simply dealing with the day-to-day -to, -day to, to be able to move into the delivery of some of the projects. Um, and that's uh, meant that we have had to pivot a little bit what we were intending to do um, and try and get some activity going until the point at which, uh, where we are now, where we're actually able to ramp up activity across all of these themes. Um, so, one of the projects that was able to get going, thanks to very hard work by Leicestershire Redland Wildlife Trust, was the Neutral Grasslands project. Work that uh, Leicestershire Redland Wildlife Trust have already been doing in and around the Elverscroft Valley, um, but the Landscape Partnership Scheme in effect is going to help extend that work. Um, they're working with a number of landowners, um, farmers primarily, but also the local golf clubs. Um, in Charnwood Forest to look at how uh, some of their neutral grasslands can be managed on the, the edge of the golf course sites. Um, we've got some volunteers um, here who were doing some uh, wildlife recording, which is an incredibly important part of managing these habitats because we need to understand um, what the health of habitats are. Uh, and, and that means recording um, what's found on site over, an, over a period of time and seeing whether what management practices are making a difference. Um, and what kind of condition that those habitats are in. On the right, there's a picture of uh, some volunteers who this year, sorry, last year, were uh, trained in traditional scything techniques. Um, and this is allowing us to manage tricky pockets of land in the Obscroft Valley where you can't get things like a large cut and collect mower in. Um, so teaching the volunteers those traditional techniques means that Small, small pockets of land can be managed in a in a way in a traditional way, but in a way that actually works um, to allow them to be to allow the arising collected and site to be managed um, and brought into really good condition. 
that work will be ongoing throughout the, the landscape partnership scheme. If you don't like spiders, can I suggest you close your eyes now um, as I move on to talking about recording nature, as I just mentioned a moment ago, it's a really important part of us monitoring and managing um, sites across the area. Wildlife identification and recording is, is a skill that takes the time to develop, um, but it's a skill that lots of people can learn and can get involved with. Um, now, ordinarily, Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust would run training face-to-face, uh, -face, um, and what they've done is, is to de de develop a series of online training courses, which are delivered on a monthly basis, um, and that's allowed us to kind of remove any uncertainty over having to cancel sessions uh, with COVID. Um, but it's also allowed us to reach a wider audience. And of course, once the training sessions are created and they're made available on YouTube, they're then available for people who perhaps can't come at the scheduled time of the session, or perhaps who just want a refresher and want to go back and watch it again, um, or, or for people that are outside of the area or parts of Leicestershire that would like to, to sort of benefit from using those training sessions so it's allowed us to reach a much wider audience um, now they will be going back to some face-to-face -face training as well but I think it's actually shown the value of, of doing a mixture of online and face-to-face -face activity they've created some fantastic resources to engage individuals and families so they've got spotter sheets for different types of, of, of habitats um, which you know helps to, to build knowledge of some of the key habitats that we're focusing on in Charnwood Forest and helps them to um, add something to the wildlife monitoring programme. Um, we're working with uh, Nature Spot now, who've created an, a, a page for the Charnwood Forest Geopark area, um, which will allow us to filter the results that are added um, onto that, that are tagged as Charnwood Forest Geopark. We'll be able to see exactly how many. Uh, species are being recorded uh, within that, that area and monitor the changes of that over time. That's going to be a really important resource for us. We have a within this a special study which is focusing on the eponymous charmwood spider. Um, now charmwood uh, or spiders of all kinds are actually very difficult to identify as those of you who, are, who do a lot of wildlife recording will be well aware um, and therefore we're working with a spider specialist who's actually coming to Charnwood Forest on a regular basis, taking samples from various different sites, um, really monitoring the, the range of a range of different spider species, but actually also carrying out a sort of specialist um, search for the Charnwood spider because it's been a while since it was recorded and we want to see whether it's available in the area and, and if it is still living in the area, which sites it's, it, it, it's in and try and think about how we can best um, create spaces that are going to be uh, are going to support those spider populations. One of our other projects within the careful theme is focusing on natural flood management. Um, if anybody lives in in Loughborough, you will know that um, occasionally there are flooding incidents um, in Loughborough. Um, one of the things that we are doing is to try and mitigate flooding in Loughborough by working with natural processes further upstream. Um, we carried out a study of the Black Brook and the Wood Brook with the Environment Agency and Trent Rivers Trust. And we now have a project which is focused on the Wood Brook. Um, and we are putting in a number of different interventions along the Woodbrook, which will slow the flow of water in, in, in high flow events. So when there's um, heavy rainfall um, and high flow, and then uh, therefore a high likelihood of flooding further downstream, our interventions further upstream will help to slow that flow um, and hold back some of the water so that we'll help to, to mitigate flooding further downstream. The interventions themselves are not just designed to uh, to support flood mitigation, but they're also designed to create habitat and to support um, support that uh, that those uh, species that are already living in the area. Um, this will include the creation of, of new ponds, of uh, large areas of wetland, 
Um, it also includes things like leaky barriers in, in the stream um, that are fairly high level, so they only become active um, in, a, in a high flow event. And the first intervention gone in um, on site in the last few weeks. Um, and I think next week we'll be starting tree planting in, in part of this area, which will be creating some fairly wide um, hedgerow um, and tree planting around some of the fields to catch water as it flows, soak up some of the water that's flowing off the um, hills around that area before they hit the wood brook. So um, conservation, of course, does not just include the habitats and biodiversity in the area, but also the geological heritage. Um, and you might think that the, the rocks don't really need much in the way of um, conservation, but of course uh, they, they do. And uh, the, there were also are challenges around um, the damage to fossil surfaces, particularly those that are in sites that are publicly accessible and therefore exposed to accidental damage as much as anything, people clambering over the rocks and actually walking across those 560 million year old um, fossil surfaces and, and, and that obviously can cause some damage but also as you can see in the picture on the right hand side there um, people sitting on the rocks and mindlessly um, vandalizing them by scoring their scoring their names in them um, creating graffiti um, so my colleague Jack is focused on trying to manage that tricky balance between Geo heritage conservation and interpretation. So how do we share the story of Charnwood's geology and the story of its fossils while still protecting those important sites? Um, this side of his work has involved auditing the condition of sites and understanding what conservation measures are needed at each of them. And of course, each one's unique and needs slightly different things. Um, the, the picture on the left is of some conservation work happening at Memorial Crags in. Bradgate Park, which I'm sure many of you would be familiar with. Um, and the, the chap there is from a, an organisation called a business called Clevedon Conservation. And they ordinarily they work on historic building conservation. Um, and what he's doing here is he's actually painting using natural pigment over the graffiti that had been scored into memorial crags. And that won't obviously get our the, the damage, it, it won't reverse the damage that has been done, um, but it has been shown through numerous studies that if you allow graffiti to stay in a place, more graffiti will be added to it and added to it and added to it. And obviously we're trying to, to counteract that. So a conservation strategy here is partly to cover up the graffiti, um, make it invisible so that people are less inclined to, um, to, to add to it. And he's done a, such a fantastic job that if you go up to, um, to, to Memorial Crags now, you won't actually be able to see at all the graffiti that's got on, on the right of the picture that's completely been um, covered up now. That's a really useful skill uh, that the, the staff at Bradgate Park uh, Trust have also been able to, to learn um, as a result of that project. So, um, Sticking with the, the geology for, for a moment, um, thinking about and thinking about the kind of long term legacy of landscape partnership scheme, we have um, the regional park board has embarked on what is likely to be about a seven year process to secure UNESCO global geopark status for Charmwood Forest. Now, this is not a protective designation in the way that um, becoming a national park is or an AONB. It doesn't actually prevent development in an area. It doesn't, um, it doesn't kind of um, have that, that level of protection, but it's really a, a badge of quality in effect. It's a designation that confers a, a recognition of globally outstanding geo heritage and importantly, a community behind it who wish to, to, to care for and celebrate that geo heritage. Now, this subject really could be a whole presentation in itself. And I'm sure if you are interested in this, um, that Jack would be very happy to come along to a future meeting of the Lyttonville and tell you a bit more about the work towards this, what it will mean about um, what it will mean for Charmwood and how we're going about doing that. 
um, and also our participation in several international research projects which are focused on that. But what we're really hoping is that work in Charnwood Forest actually becomes a model for geo-heritage conservation, not just nationally, um, but also that we've got something to add globally to the, to the study of geo-heritage conservation because we've got such interesting sites and ones which are in public accessible places which present challenges that other, some other countries don't have to really face um, with their conservation. And then moving on to um, our resilient honeypot sites uh, project. So outwards, Beacon Hill and Bradgate Park are the three most visited sites in Charmwood Forest. And so we have a strand of activity which is focused on um, conservation, restoration and enhancement works at each of those three sites. Um, now, in the early part of the pandemic, this has consisted partly of emergency support. So emergency support to help them manage uh, those increasing numbers of visitors to manage some of the pressures that that put the sites under. And that was things like um, walkie talkies to help them communicate with, with new volunteer patrols um, when we had to up those during very busy periods. Um, matting that could be put down to protect some of the paths and sites. Um, even things like litter pickers, for the increased volume of litter with people coming to the area who perhaps hadn't been, you know, didn't don't normally go out into nature and actually didn't really know quite how to, to behave um, when they when they got to the site. Um, but now as we're moving forward in the project, we'll actually start some of the work for originally planned for these sites, um, which includes a whole range of things from footpath restoration, creating more accessible trails for people with um, physical disabilities, um, improvements to uh, car parks, for example, so outwards where there are no um, marked parking bays, there are going to be some um, some installations there that will be blended into the natural environment, but will actually demarcate the, the, the the, um, car parking spaces a bit more effectively uh, so that they can manage their, their visitors without having to try and increase the size of the car park, which obviously wouldn't be possible. Um, and then various habitat restoration works at each of those, each of those sites. So for the final bit of my presentation, I'm just going to share with you a little bit um, about what we've got planned coming up for the next the next uh, six months or so and what you might see happening in and around Charnwood Forest. So uh, we have the initial phases of some works outwards which are likely to be starting in the coming months and also the creation of a strategic link between outwards and Beacon Hill. So those of you that walk in the area will know that it's actually quite difficult um, and unsafe to walk between Outwards and Beacon Hill um, because you have to walk along a, a grass verge, um, quite a dangerous road next to it. We're going to be creating a, a footpath that's in that's basically alongside the carriageway, um, but will actually make it possible for people to walk safely uh, between those two, two sites. And that in effect will allow us to create a route that will link Loughborough and Leicester through the middle of Charnwood Forest, um, but will be completely off-road. So it will be possible for people to access some of the sites without taking their car um, and also to move between sites without needing to get back in their car and, and drive to another site. Um, other capital projects that we've got will include uh, the creation of wood pasture, um, hedgerow restoration, orchard planting that I mentioned earlier, and more neutral grassland management um, led by Leicester and Rutland Wildlife Trust. We have the second phase of our natural flood management project with more capital works taking place um, now between now and right the way through the summer and into the early autumn, which will include ponds and wetland creation and I think one of the things that might be nice if you do site visits will be um, to organise a site visit for you potentially to come out and, and see some of that natural flood management work and habitat creation work. Um, we've got site improvements happening in outdoor learning spaces in our schools and access improvements at a number of different sites. 
And we've also got the launch um, later this month of the Managing the Landscape grant scheme, which will be a third party grant for landowners. And that will in effect enable us to work on more sites um, and to support some of the landowners uh, that are not partners already within the, the project. Um, or even sites where there are uh, projects which are really outside of the, the scope of the scheme but are worthwhile doing. So, for example, um, there's a project that Leicestershire and Rutland Wildlife Trust would like to carry out at Charnwood Lodge, um, and ideally we'd like to be able to help um, support that. But there are obviously a number of other schemes, but there are a number of other projects that uh, would fall into that category. Um, and then on the sort of community projects front, we've got volunteering and training projects and supporting groups to help them grow their volunteer base. Um, we've got training courses focused on all of the key habitats of woodland, grassland, heathland, um, orchards. So just to help support the management of that landscape. Of course, it's not just the big sites like Bradgate, Beacon, but actually smaller sites like, um, you know, Mount Sorrel and Raithley Heritage Centre, just to an example, um, which are managing a, a site, have a bit of landscape habitat that they want to look after, and we can provide training and support to groups like them or Grace U Priory Trust, for example, um, to help with any work that they want to do on site. Um, we have our education and outreach program, our resources for primary school, and our health and wellbeing program of green and social prescriptions, and nature connectivity. Um, and the work that we're doing to support uh, groups and businesses um, to extend and extend their capacity um, and help them to do more that actually benefits the, the landscape that they're living in and working in. And then we also have a series of research projects. So the fossil site audit, which will continue and some conservation research. Uh, we're inviting a researchers from outside of the area also to come and carry out studies that are going to support the long-term management of our sites, um, especially things like looking at that, that link between biodiversity and geodiversity. On the heritage front, we're hoping to get our archival research um, strand up and running this year um, and our LIDAR survey work, which will build on some of the important work that was carried out during the Charmwood Roots project. Um, a study of our stone walls across Charmwood Forest, which are one of the important cultural and built heritage assets that we have, and is also, of course, a habitat for invertebrates and for lichen. Um, so as part of that, there'll be a, a lichen survey, which will be commissioned, and then there'll be ongoing work on the Charmwood Spider Survey and biodiversity monitoring. So lots and lots of exciting work um, going on. And if you'd like to stay in touch with that work, there are a number of different ways can do that. Um, we'll be launching our new website later this year. It's an, we're just about to go out to tender for our, our new website. That will be created soon, but there are social media channels up and running already. Um, so if any of you are using Facebook, Instagram or Twitter, you can follow us at these, um, at these addresses. And I really recommend them. Um, I, I don't actually contribute great, a great deal to the social media. It's mainly done by my, by my colleague, Jack. Um, and he puts up all sorts of interesting things that are really pulled for, stories that are pulled from um, all uh, projects across the scheme. So it's a really good way of keeping in touch with what, what we're doing. Um, we also have the stakeholder forum, groups and organizations that have an interest in Charmwood Forest. Um, if your group is not already on our stakeholder forum and would like to be, you're very welcome to, um, to, to join us. We've got our next meeting on the 30th of March, which we're hoping will be in person at County Hall. Um, so lit the Lytton Field will be very, Natural History section will be very welcome to send a representative for that if you'd like to. Um, so those are some of the different ways in which you can, um, you can stay in touch with what we're doing. So I'm very happy to, uh, it's been a bit of a whistle-stop tour through all of the work that we're doing, um, but I, I hope that you found it of, of interest. I'd be very happy to, to take any questions that people have. Um, I'll uh, end, end the slideshow now, Alan, if that's okay. Thank you, Julie. Yes, thanks very much for that, uh, bringing us up to date. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure it's been a challenging uh, couple of years. Uh, for you, perhaps more than the rest of us, even. Um, uh, 
but do we have any questions for Julie? You can either type in the chat window or put your hand up or wave at me or just talk. Sue, Sue, you've got a question. Hi there. Hi, Julie. Thank you for a very informative uh, uh, lecture. That was uh, really most enjoyable. Um, one of the questions that springs to mind, you were saying earlier about the um, obviously the importance of uh, Charmwood Forest, all its very the factors that, that go up to make that, that importance for the area. Um, but um, it, it can't seem to, none of that can seem to protect it from any kind of development. Um, what criteria um, does a, a, an area have to have before it reaches the sort of the national park status where it then becomes protected? Because, you know, even as a geopark, you would think that uh, it, would, it should have enough protection yeah, so it's a really good question, Sue, and I think um, it is challenging. I mean, obviously, national park status is something that uh, it, it, there's not a kind of benchmark. And once you reach it, you become a national park or an AOMB. It's something that an area has to decide to apply for. And that's only when the government decides that it's, that it's willing to consider um, new applicants. As some of you might know, there will be you know, there, there is talk at the moment about um, uh, different designations, what those might look like in future. So there is the possibility, and there's no, and I don't think it's been entirely ruled out, um, that Charmwood Forest could apply for one of those designations in the future. Um, I think the, the advantage of uh, the UNESCO Global Geopark status will come from um, the, the, the soft, the kind of soft power that it that it gives locally if something has um, an international designation that is um, bringing um, recognition and investment to the area it, it's something you can also lose and so if you are not uh, collectively managing that area in a way which is which allows you to retain that designation um, there is a, a risk to all of the things that you've invested in and to the investment that you're bringing into the area. And so that puts pressure on the, the various organisations that are actually trying to, to look after that, that, that area in a good way, if you know what I mean. So it, it encourages them to think very, very carefully about um, management decisions uh, and, and planning decisions and what kind of development might be allowed in, in an area. And it's also something that then is very likely to be written into things like local plans, um, so that when people are thinking like five years into the future, that it, it, it's something that is given written consideration whenever any planning decisions come up, and urban development decisions come up. But I think um, you know, just to kind of reassure you, I guess, all of the, the organisations that sit on the regional park board are very, very aware of the importance of Charnwood Forest. Um, and the regional park board also has the chief planning officers on and, and, that, and we're constantly talking to them about the importance of protecting Charnwood Forest, and protecting green corridors that link out from the forest into the wider Leicestershire area. Um, so I think um, at the moment, it, 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 it's still quite challenging to, to, to protect it in quite the way some of us, all of us would ideally like. Um, but I think that status will help in many ways if we, can, if we can get it. But it's a long road and there's quite a lot of work to do in the meantime. I hope that answers your question. Sue. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, yes, other Sue. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm interested in the uh, concept of learning through landscapes and I'm reminded that I was involved in a project about 15 years ago when my son was at primary school. But I noticed on the plan that you showed for the primary school, I think it's in Anstey or somewhere like that, that um, the large areas of the plans were covered in tarmac and synthetic turf. And there is a big problem at the moment because a lot of people are thinking that it's a good thing to cover your garden in plastic 
exclude the wildlife. I understand the problems about you having to mow your lawn, but it doesn't, particularly in a situation, in a school situation, it's not good to normalise the idea that uh, landscapes are covered in plastic and that somehow nature is excluded from those areas. And equally, along the edge of the um, plastic, there were some rather anonymous round bushes. Why not have a natural hedge there? Um, if we don't teach children from a young age that these things are important, then we've lost the argument. Yeah, that, you are you are right. The, I should say, in defence of that of, of that particular um, that particular plan, there is a requirement for hard surfaced areas for the playground for for the children. So the the wildlife section is actually only partly shown on that on that plan, and and actually we're taking up tarmac and putting in wildlife areas and so it will be I'm pleased to hear it because it's really it's so important that yeah. the children can actually understand the cycle of trees that flower and then fruit and then drop their leaves and yeah. you know grass that has things growing in it and even creepy crawlies yeah. and if you put plastic there you know it normalizes what people do in their own gardens too yeah. and certainly talking to local gardeners here they're losing their jobs because people are covering their gardens in astroturf. It's horrific. Yeah, I, I, I sympathise completely with that. And I think um, one of the things that we're trying to do is work with the school, with the sites that they've got, and with, within the constraints that they've got, um, to try and identify areas that can be rewilded in effect or, or where habitats can be created. And the, the ANSTI site is quite interesting because much of it is concrete. Um, and, and tarmac and so we're actually taking out some of that and, and trying to create wildlife areas and then in the back where they've got basically a fairly anonymous playing field we're going to be creating a hedgerow that runs all the way down the side of the field and connects to a new orchard that we're planting so yeah. there'll be a whole set of, of different um, different plantings that will happen on that site that will really hopefully encourage a lot more nature back onto the but park. please no green plastic <laughs> it's just horrendous thank, thank you, you. Okay, thank you i uh, um, think maybe one time for one more anybody else russell yeah uh, as there's nobody else um uh julie the the there's always a um a, a conflict, I think, between engaging people and keeping them out uh, in order to conserve. Uh, it quite quite a tricky problem. I, I got a few glimpses of what you are thinking uh, in terms of creating paths that encourage people to stay on them, and so on. Any, any more thoughts about this tricky challenge? Yeah, I think it's partly about um, making sure that, uh, that there are sites that are accessible for people and that, that people that want to come out and just want to like walk to the tea room, you know, the Deer Barn tea room, for example, at Bradgate and then go back and go home again. That that's possible that they can do that, um, that there are other areas that people can access where, I mean, at the moment, there are sites in Charnwood Forest that would like people to visit them they perhaps want to increase the people that engage with their site because they need more donors to support their their activities and the conservation and work on their site but at the moment most people go to the places that they know so we want to try and help encourage some of the sites that want more visitors to um to 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 have have that you know to to have that opportunity um, but also to keep those areas that really need to be um, kept kind of wild and, um, and, and to avoid encouraging more people to go to, you know, to some of those sites. So, so I would say places like Charnwood Lodge, for example, that are very sensitive, um, we don't want to be encouraging more people to go there. So that's not going to be on a list of places where we'd be encouraging people to go. Um, um, because you know it's fine if we've got like a, a group who perhaps um, are coming specifically to study the geology of the site and it's organised. And but what we don't want is masses of people 
tramping in from Loughborough and Colville and being encouraged to go to sites that are very sensitive and need to be looked after. So it's, it is a tricky balancing act, but I think it's partly about the messaging, it's partly about how we do it and which sites we promote, which ones we don't, and how we use those sites for people. Um, but certainly, you know, places like Morley Quarry, for example, there are some great assets there that people should be able to go and see and enjoy, like the wonderful unconformity that you can go, geological unconformity that you can go and see, stand right up next to it in a way that you can't at, at Barden Quarry. Um, and it would be lovely to be able to take people there and to show them that and for them to enjoy that site and also to get vol a volunteer group going there that can help manage the site and manage some of the antisocial behaviour that perhaps happens there at the moment because it's not heavily used by people in the local area, even though it's just a stone's throw from Shep Shed. So yes, they are really interesting challenges, very difficult ones. And I don't think we've got all the right answers yet either. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you. Um, so time is going on. Can I invite um, Hazel to make some concluding remarks? <clears throat> yeah, thanks, Alan. Oh, thanks enormously for that, Julie. Um, I think a lot of us have known a bit about the, um, the Charnwood Forest project. Um, a lot of us feel passionate about Charnwood Forest, I certainly do, um, but you've sort of actually really sort of explained exactly what is going on. I mean, I, I think some of us knew a little bit about it and then we had the lockdowns and we didn't know what you could do and what you couldn't do. And, and the way you've actually produced this tonight I think all of us here will have a much clearer idea of what's actually happening on our doorstep. And well, uh, understanding is, al is always good. And you've presented that in a, a beautiful way. And uh, I think it's given us all lots of things to think about when we go away. So thank you very, very much indeed for this. It's been really, really interesting evening. Thank you very much. Thank you, Hazel. <laughs>